as we are, but he did not sin, give us grace to discipline ourselves in the submission of your Holy Spirit, that as you know our weaknesses, so may we know your power to save us nonetheless. We ask you through the same Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. The lesson prescribed by the Church for this morning's Holy Mass is taken from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Armin was an my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien. Few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. With a terrifying display of power and with signs of wonder, and he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring you the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, had given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Here ends the lesson prescribed by the church for this morning's Holy Mass. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and your own intelligence to lie not. It was I who made the earth and humans and beasts on the face of the earth. By my great power, with my outstretched arm, and I can give them to whoever I think fit. The Almighty and eternal God, cleanse the lips of the prophet Isaiah with a burning coal. <coughs> cleanse my heart and my lips through your gracious mercy, that I may worthily proclaim your holy gospel through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord be in my heart and on my life, that I may worthily proclaim this holy gospel. Amen. <coughs> the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. And filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus returned from the Jordan led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and for forty days he was there tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was hungry. And the devil said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. And then he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in that single instant. And the devil said to Jesus, I shall give to you all of this power and their glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I may give it to whomever I wish. All this will be yours if you worship me. Jesus sent him in reply, It is also written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you revere. And then he led him up to Jerusalem, made him stand on the parapet of the temple, and he said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and with their hands they will support you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him in reply, It also says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a time. By the words of this holy gospel, they are sent to be forgiven.
Right? This is taken from the morning's gospel according to Saint Luke. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I know this is the first Sunday of Lent, but Christmas wasn't all that long ago this year. It kind of feels more like Christmas today than it actually did on Christmas Day when it was warm up. That sort of helps us to better understand this morning's gospel. It's the temptation account from Luke. Now Luke's gospel starts off with the Christmas story of the shepherds that we all know. And then it was about a decade passed by before it tells us about the only story that we have of Jesus as an adolescent. And then for the second time, about another decade passes by, and now we hear about Jesus' baptism by John. It's at this point that Luke then tells us about the human ancestry of Jesus all the way back to Adam. And as the way he finishes the ancestry count, he says, Adam, the son of God, with a small s. All of these stories accumulate to let us know that Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter's son, is the Son of God with a capital S. Luke first tells us that Jesus is the Son of God through these various stories, and then today he tells us how Jesus is tested as the Son of God. Now Mark is the oldest of the four Gospels, and his temptation of Jesus lasts nothing but two verses long. Luke's, as we just read, is 13 verses long. So there are obviously more than one version of that temptation story floating around in the earliest church, and some are much more elaborate than others. And so when you have more than one account, you can tell that this is part literary and not always just historical. So no one was out there with Jesus. What we're reading is not a news report. There's no cameraman on the scene. And it definitely appears, however, that Jesus did retreat into the seclusion of the desert because he had to really sort things out. And for lack of a better phrase, Jesus had to find himself. For Jesus, what did it mean exactly when at his baptism, God from heaven says to him, you are my beloved son? Just imagine, remember, Jesus is the carpenter's son. And I'm sure that there were some extraordinary things in his life, but for the most part, he is a religious man but he hasn't yet come to the realization of who he is. And all of a sudden, this realization from heaven says to him, you are my beloved son. What would you do? How would you process that? It's not hard to imagine why Jesus would need time alone in order to work through this sort of a realization. You are my beloved son. Remember, Jesus is us. He, he, if he has anything a lot more than us, then he and his human connection to us is, is broken. So Jesus is trying to process this as us. So the temptation in the desert is real, but it's the job of the literary details to try and help not Jesus, but us, to understand the incomprehensible. What was going through the mind of the Son of God? What in the world would the temptation of Jesus, the Son of God, be like? How in the world are we ordinary humans to ever comprehend what the Son of God had to process in the confines of the limitations of the human nature of Jesus of Nazareth, so that he, Jesus, would come to grips with who he truly was and what he had to do to save the entire world. You know, on Thursday, scientists from Caltech and MIT announced that they had discovered actual evidence of gravitational waves. They say it's the biggest discovery since Galileo turned his telescope to the heavens. You know, these things have been theorized for a century, but no one ever detected them. And it's not surprising since gravitational waves they stretch and they squeeze the entire Milky Way galaxy, they say, by the width of my thumb. The entire galaxy moving this distance, and they actually measure it. I've seen a picture of Einstein's notebook with the equation when they first talked about gravitational waves. And it may as well have been the scribblings on the wall of a two-year-old. It made absolutely no sense to me. But then come along people who are a lot smarter than I, and they start to give examples from daily life. They come up with these really cool graphics. And then I can start to begin to understand what they're talking about. And that's what Luke is trying to do with his story about the temptation of Jesus. Luke is trying to make Jesus' incredible and indescribable inner turmoil, trying to make it manageable for us. The purpose of the fantastic images of the devil flying the bodily Jesus through the air and standing him on top of the parapet of the temple in Jerusalem, those are no different. Those are no different kinds of stories when scientists try to explain gravitational waves to the rest of us who don't have a clue what the math means by saying stuff like, it's like turning a silent movie into a talkie because the waves are the soundtrack of the cosmos, they say. Until this moment, we had our eyes on the Milky Way, but then scientists say, now we can hear the music of the universe. 
How cool is that imagery, the music of the universe? But if you actually heard that little blip, it's not really music, but you know, these people, they hear that and they see so much more, they're trying to make us understand what that little blip means. So let's not fixate on the fantastic images of Luke. Instead, let's try to imagine what they're trying to explain to us. The refusal of Jesus to turn stone into bread, that first temptation, it probably sums up Jesus' temptation to take advantage of the miraculous so that he doesn't have to do the hard work of the gospel. You know, I could fill every seat in. If anybody came up with any kind of physical problem, I could lay my hands on them and they would disappear. Or I could make weird things happen all around here. I could fill this place with the miraculous. I remember watching a Star Trek episode when I was a kid and the, the Enterprise rediscovered out on some corner of the universe somewhere the extraordinary beings who were once worshipped here on Earth as the old Greek gods. You know, miracles were once enough to lead to devotion, but by the time of Star Trek, you know, that didn't last anymore. So you can fool people with power, but that doesn't make them worship. It doesn't change them. And the second temptation of worldly power is easily imagined. When we see Jesus is surrounded and all the people that he knows and loves are surrounded by a hated Roman Empire, how natural it would have been for him to see himself as a national hero sent by God if he could get rid of the Romans, if he could liberate the people of God. And the third temptation of that grand and heavenly sign performed before the temple for all the religious authorities to see and to witness, you know, throughout the Gospels, you keep hearing about the authority saying to Jesus, we want a sign from heaven about who you are. And Jesus has to keep backing away. He says, no, I'm not, that's not the way I'm going to do it. But what a, what a wonderful, ostentatious display that would have been if they said Jesus jumped off the temple and angels came and lowered him to the ground. But Jesus said, no, that's not the way I have to preach the Gospel. So Jesus, in other words, had to get away and figure out what God expected of him and I think Jesus of the first day out of the desert would have been surprised by the Jesus of the 40th day because those temptations, they were real for Jesus. These were, is this the way the Messiah is supposed to be? Because that's the Messiah that was expected. And then they were rejected by Jesus. So the Jesus who went out to the desert with all of these temptations, he comes back and he's not the same man anymore. The Jesus who went out into the wilderness looked the same as the one who came out but he saw things differently. You know, it's Lent, and we're supposed to read the Bible. Read the beginning of the Gospel accounts and listen to John the Baptist and how he preached. Just before the 40 days, Jesus may have been a part of that end time and judgment community around John. And then read and listen to almost anything else that Jesus preaches in the Gospel. Jesus saw things differently after the desert than he did before. You know, about 10 days ago, I went and I had my eyeglass frames adjusted. And they were already old frames. And then last Sunday, I'm cleaning the lens and the glasses, and my glasses broke right in half right here at the bridge. And so I'm sitting there with two, two, two pair of glasses in my hand, one for each of the eyes. And, and so I had to go get them, you know, repaired and all that and fixed them. And so I still haven't gotten back. I won't get them back till the midweek. So I'm kind of stumbling around because this is an old prescription. I don't see things as clearly as I should. It was real hard just reading the gospel there because everything is a little bit blurry. So just know that that's the glasses because I gave up adult beverages for Lent. So it's the glasses and nothing else. But that whole idea about Lent is that it helps us to see things better. It's our prescription upgrade. It helps us to see things the way Jesus see th sees things. You know, if Jesus needed those 40 days of solitude, and prayer, fasting, and sacrifice out in the wilderness, if Jesus needed those 40 days, well then, can you imagine how much more we do? So may our 40 days, may they help us to see things better, to see things the way Jesus would, May they help us to find our spiritual path, just as they helped Jesus to find his. Let us use the opportunities of Lent to see Christ in our spiritual selves ever better. And for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
pray, Lord, that they do find some place to find warmth and that there are good people in this world uh, who will provide that for them. We also offer our prayers at this time in memory of Althea Rose Fortier on the first anniversary of her death, sadly missed by her grandmother, Mary Lou Fortier, and the rest of the family is offered by Mary Lou Fortier. We also offer our prayers for Mildred Merlicki and whatever tests and procedures she may have to undergo this week. We pray that God be with her and that guide all of her doctors and possibly even her surgeon. as offered by friends here at Holy Name of Jesus. We also continue to offer our prayers for the following for a battle with cancer. Doug Robinson, my daughter Jenny Whitman and Karen Persing. Tom Nidal, by Teresa Belisle. John Whitten, by friends here at Holy Name. Meg Connors, by Ellen and Don Skrosky. Marie Lovett and Carl Dickinson, by Joe and Peg Kuschuk. Randy Clemens, by her grandmother, Dottie Veronis, and fathers, <coughs> John Bielczek, and Maurice Lazelle, as offered by myself. And also we continue to offer prayers for Frank, Skr uh, Frank Skrosky, as offered by his twin brother, Don Skrosky, the Gates, and Kirk and Dollar families. Are there any petitions? Yes. Um, I would like to let you know that John passed away yesterday. I'm sorry, who? John Oh, John Wynn that we just prayed for, he passed away? Oh, okay, I'm sorry to hear that. We'll say a, a requiem prayer for John Wynn. Any other prayers? Oh, my Lord, for all these prayers and for all those of us here gathered, we ask that you hear the private prayers we bring before your altar. We also ask that you be with all of us here and all of those who are parish who are unable to be with us here today and those who are parish who have chosen not to be with us here today. And so along with our special change of prayer for John Whitten from prayer for help to a requiem prayer, we offer these prayers by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven.
sacrifice and yours may be accepted to God, the Father Almighty. Amen. Eternal Father, receive these gifts that we now offer to you, and through the death and the resurrection of your Son, Jesus, transform us into his likeness. We ask this through the same, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God. Throughout all ages of ages, Father, are in me, and I am in you, 
may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent them, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. After these other words of the high priest in prayer and his holy word, our Savior took bread into his holy and venerable hands, and having lifted his eyes to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving thanks to you, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, All of you take and eat of this, for this is my body. In like manner after supper, taking also this excellent chalice into his holy and venerable hands, again giving thanks to you, he blessed it and gave it to his disciples, saying, All of you take and drink of this, for this is the chalice of my blood of the new and eternal testament, the mystery of faith, which for you and for many shall be shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you shall do these things, do them in remembrance of me. all to your faithful people, the remembrance of this Christ, your Son and our Lord, is also his blessed passion, resurrection, and his glorious ascension. We receive from your own gifts and presence a pure offering, a holy offering, an immaculate offering, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of eternal salvation. These gifts we receive with a joyful countenance, as from him, who is the giver of all temporal and eternal good gifts, and with an unshakable faith, they will become for our souls a saving remedy. We humbly beseech you, Almighty God, command that our prayers be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your highest altar before the countenance of your divine majesty. That as many of us as receive this all to the most sacred body and blood of your Son may be filled with every blessing and grace through Christ our Lord. Amen. Be mindful also, Lord, of your servants and handmaidens, all who have gone before us with the sign of faith, and who have passed on to eternity. To these souls, O Lord, as also to those who have died in Christ, grant everlasting life, and to those who during life strayed from the path of righteousness, unmindful of your Father and love, Mercifully sure their sufferings, we beseech you, in the name of Christ our Lord, and your beloved Son. And grant us, your sinful servants, who hope in the greatness of your mercy, some part in fellowship with your holy apostles, martyrs, and all your saints, who shed their blood for your name's sake, whose hearts were always open to justice and mercy, and whose lives patterned after the divine Master, merit and eternal bliss. Remember us, O Lord, your company, with confidence we ask you, not because of our merits, but that you bestow forgiveness through Christ our Lord, by whom, O Lord, these gifts you always create, sanctify, revive, bless, and bestow upon us all these good things. Through him, and with him, and in him, and to you, God, the Father Almighty, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and all glory. Throughout all ages of ages, let us pray, admonished by salutary precepts, and following divine institution, we make bold to say.
seat you a large model, past, present, and future. And when you deem it necessary to test us, grant us the same serenity of spirit which you bestowed on the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed apostles, martyrs, and all of those who resolutely marched under the banner of our Savior, that being supported by your help, may always be free from sin and secure from all despair. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, ever one God. Throughout all ages of ages, takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy. You should enter into my heart, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Lord, I am not worthy. You should enter into my heart, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Lord, I am not worthy. You should enter into my heart, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Peace and blessing. God, God, God. 
thee, and their blood which I have drunk, cling to my innermost being, to grant that no sin remaineth when these holy sacraments are lives and reigns forever. Thank you. 